Hey guys, this is Craig Migliaccio with AC Service Tech, and today what we're going over is how to check the refrigerant charge of a system with a fixed orifice using the total superheat method. Check out our book, The Refrigerant Charging and Service Procedures for Air Conditioning. In this book, we go over the preparation of the system for refrigerant, checking the refrigerant charge, and troubleshooting methods. You can check out the full outline of the book and also purchase the book over at acservicetech.com. In order to check the refrigerant charge of an air conditioning system, you first have to check to see what type of metering device the system has. Does it have a thermostatic expansion valve or does it have a piston or capillary tubing? So on this system here, we have a piston and you can tell that just by the nut right in front of the air handler. So right where the small liquid line enters the, the lower portion of the air handler, there's a nut right there and inside that nut there is a piston. So we need to check the refrigerant charge of this system with the total superheat method. If the system had a capillary tubing, once again, you'd check it with the total superheat method. And if the system had a thermostatic expansion valve, then you would need to check the refrigerant charge using the subcooling method. It's kind of nice checking the refrigerant charge with the subcooling method because you can tell what the target subcooling is just by looking over at the rating plate. It's usually posted right there as the target subcooling or the TXV subcooling. But when you check the refrigerant charge of a system with a fixed orifice such as a piston, you need to use the total superheat method. So in order to find the target superheat, you need to take two measurements. One is the indoor wet bulb temperature and the other is the outdoor dry bulb temperature. The indoor wet bulb temperature is measured with a digital psychrometer and, and you're measuring that several feet before the evaporator coil. So you're measuring it in the return duct and if the return grill is very close to the air handler, then you can check the wet bulb temperature there. But if not, we typically drill a small 3 8 hole in the return duct and then we place the digital psychrometer in that hole in order to check our wet bulb temperature. When you're done, you just plug that hole with a 3 8 inch duct plug. So anyway, you see that we have a digital psychrometer right in the return there and it's reading a indoor wet bulb temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're going to take that wet bulb temperature and then we're also going to look at our outdoor dry bulb temperature. We're going to measure the outdoor standard dry bulb temperature about a foot away from the outdoor condenser coil, which is where the, the inlet of the airflow is. So we don't want to measure at the top, typically where the air is blowing out very hot. We want to measure our temperature as the incoming air temperature to the outdoor coil. And as you see right here, we're reading 92 degrees. You take that wet bulb and dry bulb temperature and you can input that onto a target superheat chart or you can put it onto a calculation or an app. And you could also just use the measurement on the digital manifold gauge set. But in this instance, we're gonna be using the target superheat chart. So if you look at 68 over at the top and you bring that down and you line it up with 90 degrees, you have a target superheat of 16 degrees. Now, right below that, you see if our outdoor dry bulb temperature was 95 degrees, it would be 14. So we're looking at right around 15 degrees as a target superheat. When we connect the refrigerant manifold gauge set, we take the red hose and we connect that to the small liquid line, and that's gonna to connect to our red high side gauge. Our blue hose connects to our large vapor line, and that connects to the blue low side vapor gauge. For the total superheat, we're gonna to need to measure our vapor line temperature within three inches. So you see that we have our temperature reader at T2 and we have a clamp on the large vapor line. It's also important to note that the tubing needs to be clean if we were gonna use a temperature clamp. You can also use a bead type temp sensor and that you'd have to tape onto that large vapor line. So once again, that needs to be within three inches of that service port in order to uh, compare your pressure and also your temperature at that location. One more thing that you want to make sure of is that the gauge set handles are shut. So before you even turn that system on, you want to have that manifold gauge set connected, your handle shut, and then you can go ahead and turn the outdoor air conditioning unit on. So before you turn the air conditioning system on and try to check the refrigerant charge, you want to go ahead in the inside of the house and make sure that you check the indoor air filter to make sure that it's clean and you want to go ahead and check the airflow speed. So what I typically do is I uh, pull the disconnect at the outdoor condensing unit and then I go inside, check the air filter and I also check the blower speeds at the control board and so after that I turn the indoor system on on air conditioning mode and I let the the airflow come out of all the registers and then I check the airflow at the registers with an anemometer. 
So this way I'm able to determine if I am blowing the correct amount of airflow across the evaporator coil. It's important to make sure that you have the right airflow at that indoor coil so that the indoor system and the outdoor system are matched. You don't want to have a 3-ton outdoor condenser matched with a 3-ton indoor evaporator coil but only running 2 tons of airflow, so that would not be good. Anyway, once you check the airflow, you make sure that that's good, the, the air filter is clean, and you go out to the outdoor unit and then you go ahead and turn on the electric to the outdoor condenser via that disconnect box right there on the wall. And after that system is turned on, now you're going to be monitoring both the blue gauge and the red gauge. Now remember that our target superheat was right about 15 degrees of target superheat. But it's going to change, and the reason for that is is the indoor wet bulb temperature is going to decrease as the system is running, and that's because you're reducing the humidity inside the building. So during the first minutes of runtime, you want to check that vapor saturated temperature on the low side gauge, and on this system right here, it's an r 4 a system. So we're checking the pressure on the outer ring, and we're going to bring that pressure into the inner ring, if you see the pink area where it's R4 tonight, and you see that the numbers are in black right there, that's going to be the saturated temperature of R4 tonight at the indoor coil. So we first need to make sure that that saturated temperature is above 32 degrees. If it's below 32 degrees, then we have a problem. So you got to give it, say, three minutes or so, three, four minutes, and that saturated temperature on the low side should be above 32 degrees if there is no problems. If there is a problem, then you may have low airflow at the indoor coil, or you could have a liquid line restriction, or you may be low on refrigerant. You can use our guidelines in the refrigerant charging book in order to determine any troubleshooting problems. So that's what's nice about that book. You can take that out in the field with you and use it as a guide to help you during your troubleshooting. After 15 minutes of runtime, you're going to check the actual temperature on the outside of the vapor tube right next to the service port on the large vapor line. And in this instance, we read 55 degrees. So we take 55 degrees minus the saturated temperature we read on the low side gauge. So we're not necessarily using pressures to check the refrigerant charge. We're just using the pressure to convert to saturated temperature, and we're using the temperatures to check the refrigerant charge. So in this instance, we see that we have 39 degrees as a saturated temperature on that low side gauge. So we take 55 minus 39, and we're left with 16 degrees of total superheat. Total superheat is measured at the outdoor condensing unit, whereas a superheat measurement will be taken right on the vapor line right after the evaporator coil. But since there are no ports there, we check the total superheat at the outdoor condensing unit. So we take that 16 degrees of total superheat and we compare that to the 15 degrees of target superheat we measured earlier. The only change here is that we want to go back into the indoor unit and check the wet bulb temperature again because maybe that has lowered by now. So now we go to the indoor wet bulb temperature and we see that we're now reading 66 degrees as the indoor wet bulb temperature. And we're also now reading 90 degrees as the outdoor dry bulb temperature. So there was 2 degrees of a change on the outdoor dry bulb and 2 degrees at the indoor wet bulb temperature. So you constantly have to monitor those temperatures because your target superheat is a moving number. It's not just a constant number or an average number like the, uh, the subcooling rating is on the outdoor unit. So if our target superheat is 13 degrees and our actual superheat is 16 degrees, then that means we're just slightly, slightly undercharged. So we could add a little bit of refrigerant. It, it really would not be much, maybe literally a half an ounce or, or just a, a very small amount. But we're, we're very close to what our target superheat needs to be, but we are 3 degrees off. If your actual total superheat is higher than your target superheat, then you need to add refrigerant. If your actual total superheat is lower than your target superheat, then you need to recover refrigerant. So you want to be within, say, 2 degrees of whatever your target superheat is at that point in time. So once again, you just got to remember that that is a moving number. You constantly have to be checking your indoor wet bulb temperature along with your dry bulb temperature in order to put it on a chart, on an app, or also just be reading it on your digital manifold gauge set in order to determine what your target superheat is at that point in time. Before adding any refrigerant, make sure that you are purging the air out of the hoses before connecting to the refrigerant bottle. 
And remember that if you're really low in refrigerant, then you really wouldn't want to add refrigerant into that system. You really want to find the leak first because what's going to happen is that refrigerant would just leak right back out again. And that's no good for the environment. And it's not good for the customer because they're going to get upset again. You really want to find that leak. You want to start looking for the leak with anti-corrosive bubble leak detector and a maybe a, either an ultrasonic leak detector or a heated diode leak detector or something like that. But if you're just a little low on refrigerant, that may have escaped out of the Schrader valve or maybe that was just from the service company checking the refrigerant charge each year. Every time you check the refrigerant charge, you are accidentally pulling a little bit of refrigerant out of the system. So that's a possibility as well. But this system would still work properly, only being 3 degrees off from what the target superheat would be. You're really looking for a what's called a delta T of 18 to 21 degrees across the evaporator coil. And the issue with that is you may not be able to get an 18 to 21 degree delta T across the evaporator coil when you have a piston or capillary tube as the metering device when the indoor heat is high. So you have a high heat load such as the high indoor wet bulb temperature. If it's really humid inside the building, you may only be getting a 15, 16 degree delta T across that coil. But once the indoor wet bulb temperature lowers, then you're going to be able to get that 18 to 21 degrees. You just got to remember that the piston cannot add more refrigerant into that system when you have a high heat load in the house like a TXV would. But if you do measure 18 to 21 degrees inside the building, it's just a confirmation that everything is good. Now, you should also check that high side gauge anytime you're checking the refrigerant charge because if you have a very high subcoiling, that could be an indication of a liquid line restriction problem. So say you had a saturated temperature on the red high side gauge of 135 degrees and you were reading, say, 80 degrees as the actual temperature on the small liquid line, that would mean that your subcoiling is 55 degrees because subcoiling is saturated temperature on the red high side gauge minus the actual temperature on the small liquid line. So if you have a very high subcoiling, like 55 degrees or something like that, you may have that uh, liquid line restriction problem. A liquid line restriction problem could be a clog at the filter dryer, it could be a clog in the screen prior to the piston, or it could be in the piston itself. But if you had a subcoiling of say 10, 20 degrees of subcoiling, depending on the, the indoor wet bulb and outdoor dry bulb, that would still be okay. Uh, you're mainly checking the refrigerant charge with the total superheat method for a system with a piston. If you want to learn more about checking the refrigerant charge and troubleshooting, check out our book. We have the full outline so you can check out all the different topics that we cover and the troubleshooting methods and the charging methods in there. We go over the system preparation as well and how to find where an airflow problem is. So we have a lot of different detailed step-by-step -step procedures in this book. We have the ebook available at our website at acservicetech.com and we have the paperback version available there as well. The paperback version is also available at Amazon. And if you're looking for other videos on refrigerant charging and troubleshooting, I have them linked in the description section below as well as some of the tools I use out in the field. I hope you enjoyed yourself and we'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.